Um, good morning, all. I'm Frederico, Fred. Um, I'm from Brazil, and we, we run a fund over there. And I would like to talk a little bit about context, because uh, there is no strategy if you don't understand um, everything that goes around. And w it's going to be brief, because I think the most important is to wait for the questions that the audience has. But um, I'd like to take to talk at least for four main points. Um, the first thing is that uh, you need to understand the playing field and Bitcoin as an asset class, or at least we are trying that Bitcoin becomes an asset class. Uh, it, it's, it has also, it has the same, uh, it's influenced by the same con conditions that any other asset. So the economy has cycles. Sometimes you're growing, sometimes you're in a recession, and these kind of things really matter to not only crypto, but uh, US dollar stock market and, and everybody is worried because we, we lost 50%, but the stock market uh, dropped uh, 1,500 points, was the largest drop a couple of days ago. Um, the second important thing is you need to understand, you need to know yourself too. And I, I would say that for individual investors, uh, before you have any strategy, this is the most important thing. You cannot have a, a strategy if you do not understand yourself, what kind of person you are. Are you a risk taker? Are you a more conservative kind of, of person? Um, do you have the time? Don't you? Uh, <clears throat> if it was uh, a game, uh, are you a striker, a midfielder? Uh, the third thing is, who, you, who are you going to play against? Because uh, it's a completely different game if you're playing against Brazil, uh, a soccer game, or let's say Argentina. No? <laughs> and, and it's the same in, in, in crypto. Uh, if you look at 2017, uh, we made a lot of kids millionaires. No? Uh, but it was one kind of game. And it's a completely different game when, when we have to play against Wall Street guys and people, professional traders coming out Forex and, and, and any other market. And they are coming. They are already in, but the, the, the game is, is getting harder and harder. And if you are not really into, you're not a professional and you're trying to do trading, you're probably going to lose money. And last for how long you're going to play, it's a completely different game playing a five-minute game, five minutes, or one day. It's a hundred meters, it's a, an Ironman. Um, so you can, you can play inter, intraday, and it's one kind of strategy. If you're going to play swing, it's a different kind of strategy. If you're going to play the long term, it's a, another kind of strategy. And I would even say that if you're going to play the long term, you're not even trading, you're more like investing. Eh? And so this kind of contest uh, is the first step when you will start considering and start uh, uh, designing what kind of strategy you are going to follow. Um, that's the first step for me. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, um, I'm Yanni Valiavets, I'm the co-founder of Economy. And uh, what uh, Economy does, uh, we're a fund management platform for blockchain-based assets. So it's a platform where you're gonna find, where you're gonna found a bunch of funds. And um, so we serve two sides. One is the investors on one side, obviously, and on the other side, the fund managers. So those are the guys that um, have certain understanding of the markets and the guys that create the funds for the people on the other side to invest in. Um, I've been in this space uh, for a long time, over four years now, so I've seen a bunch of things, and uh, we'll talk more about that later. Cool. Thank you. Hi there, uh, my name is Justin Chow. I, um, I work for Cumberland. Uh, we are one of the largest OTC market makers in cryptocurrencies in the world. Uh, my background is as a professional trader. Um, we come, we came into this business in 2014, and we're a wholly, solely, wholly owned subsidiary of a U.S. Uh, principal trading firm called DRW uh, that was founded um, in 1992. So 
uh, now entering into the cryptocurrency space, uh, bringing our expertise. Uh, a lot of the guys on our team come from professional trading backgrounds, uh, foreign exchange, commodities, um, interest rates, et cetera. And we're here to essentially provide liquidity, institutional size liquidity to the market. Um, so a lot of guys that we trade with will be similar to the crypto funds, um, high net worth individuals, uh, crypto enthusiasts who got into cryptos early on and are finding it difficult to, to get out, uh, don't have the liquidity. Uh, they can come to us for that. Um, we trade uh, 24 hours a day, seven days, almost, sorry, five days a week right now, soon to be seven. Um, and I think, you know, just a little insight to our company and what we're trying to do here is we're really looking to bring crypto trading into the sort of the 2.0 in the professional realm uh, where people can access very good liquidity all times of the day, just like any other asset class, whether it's FX or credit. Um, that's why we've also staffed a lot of professional traders on the team coming into the space to make sure we can provide uh, really good prices and good liquidity at all times. Um, and so we're very excited about the crypto space. My background is in Forex and uh, coming into the crypto realm right now, seeing the, the, uh, the volatility, seeing you know, the, the energy that people have in the space is extremely exciting for guys like us. Um, so we're pretty excited to, to be involved. Cool. And the, I, I'm Denis Simagin, uh, Managing Director of LaToken, responsible for, um, uh, for product development. Okay, maybe uh, we discuss uh, in a few words your view on the current market conditions. So everybody is worried uh, uh, about um, uh, the fall. Yeah, the, by 50 percent. Uh, uh. Do you hear? Ah, oh, much better. Okay, so everybody is worried that um, during one month um, uh, the market lost like 50 percent. Yeah. So what do you think? Will it jump back soon or? Uh, Continue the fall. Yeah, well, I, I think you know it's really important to put things into context. Um, you know, as a as a career uh, finance professional, I look at you know, capital markets throughout history. Uh, you look at things like oil moves in the 80s. You look at the tech bubble, for example. Um, you know, even look at stock market in 2008 and now in cryptocurrencies, etc. I think in, in a market that's nascent, that's growing, um, that does not have a lot of liquidity, that has a very finite amount of participants, you're always going to get heightened volatility. Um, this is something that will change over time as more players come to the system. Uh, there's better liquidity, guys like us coming in trying to provide two-way liquidity at all moments in time. Um, naturally, you'll see that volatility will start to, to decline and, and the ranges will become smaller. Um, so I think it's actually very healthy. And in fact, it's, it's quite funny. Uh, when, when, when Bitcoin went from 5,000 to 19,000, no one complained. And you know that's, that's more than a 50% move. Um, but on the way down, and actually what's, what's interesting is that pundits would have come out there and say, oh, well, this, this is a bubble now. It's something that's really dangerous, right? Uh, and now we've had, you know, a, maybe a strong correction, but it's still relatively healthy, um, and people are, are kind of worried. But naturally, I think, you know, this is, this is just a phenomenon for an early stage market. Um, as I mentioned, the tech bubble is probably the, the best example where you see a lot of companies coming out early, early on in, in the bubble, um, the market rising exponentially. And then as things stabilize, some of those guys you know, don't exist anymore. And now you have a lot of gigantic, very healthy companies operating in the tech space, like companies like Google, Facebook, Apple, et cetera. So I think it's just a natural progression. Um, you know, we're not too worried about it. Obviously, the volatility is, is, uh, is something that, uh, as a professional, you'd have to understand how to weather that. So size accordingly, for example. Uh, things are moving a lot. You cannot have a gigantic position. Um, and just being able to understand that, and that's, again, I think coming back to Cumberland and what we're doing over here, it's why we've put so many professionals on this desk now, guys who have seen this kind of volatility, guys who understand uh, illiquid markets and early emerging markets, because this asset class of cryptos behaves very much like an emerging market right now. So we have, like, you know, I've traded emerging market FX and credit for, for a long time. Um, Ash and my colleague as well, FX options and liquid stuff. So I think if you've seen this kind of stuff before, it's actually not that surprising. Um, and if you haven't, then you know it would it would be it would be good to, to proceed with a little bit of caution. Jenny, I fully agree, especially with the with the last part. If if you've been exposed to that before, it's something normal. And uh, there was a big uh, back then. It was only a Bitcoin bubble in late 2013, um, where things were the same uh, as they're right now. But there was like a smaller group of people that were exposed to that. And they kind of got used to it, like you said. And now there's a huge number of newcomers that came out and are, are seeing that for the first time. And just like you said, it was pretty normal to go from 5K to 19K. No one complained. And that happened like in, what, five, six weeks or so. And now that it's back down to what it was just like 
less than two months ago, it's crashing. Like, how is that a crash? Because like two months ago, that would be an all-time high. Um, and uh, the, bu the bubbles are the natural cycle of everything. Um, if you would think of something that's not a bubble, many of you would think of uh, gold. But uh, if you stretch the gold price like 30 years um, time span, and uh, if you take a look at the last six months of the blockchain like market caps, uh, you'll actually see the same pattern, which is surprising, but it's true. And um, yeah, bubbles are here to stay. It'll just go bigger. Um, for us, it's also a natural correction. And if you look at the picture, it's just like uh, the tech, uh, the first times in the internet, Netscape, and this kind of this kind of stuff. But if you look at charts, and six months ago, it, it's it's the same, uh, and not only for Bitcoin because it, you say okay, Bitcoin has dropped like fifty percent, but uh, for all the altcoins, they they did they went up last June, July, then we spent like. A, 60 days in hell in September, October, and then everybody was happy again because everybody made like two times, three times in, in December. It, it was his money, and we're going down again. And, and that, that's an, a natural cycle for any asset. Uh, I, I don't think why people should be worried, but I think that's important too because you, you kind of uh, wash the market and make people more aware that um, it's a dangerous market because it's too fast if you're not on the if you're not really uh, uh, aware of everything that's going on or in front of your computer, computer, you can lose half your money in like hours, sometimes even minutes, uh, depending how your portfolio uh, is. And, and, and this is important because uh, uh, I think the community and, and especially the retail investor uh, start to, to be aware that this is not free money. There is no free money. There is no free lunch. So you need to understand what you're doing and act accordingly. And also consider who you are. What kind of, uh, you will not put your savings 100% in crypto because if you did, now you have a problem. Right? So uh, as professionals, you observed uh, the market evolution. So the market is very young, yeah, but uh, it's... Uh, um, uh, develops very dynamically. Uh, so, uh, how uh, uh, how the market evolved? How uh, the average, for example, uh, traders profile uh, changed during this uh, uh, this period, and uh, maybe how the uh, trading strategies uh, were changing. Yeah. What's you, what's your view? Um. Yeah, I think when, when we look at our business, um, you know, DRW started trading cryptocurrencies in 2012, um, and we founded Cumberland to make markets uh, two-sided liquidity in 2014. Um, <clears throat> the counterparty base that we had in the early days were, were kind of the enthusiasts, so early investors in cryptocurrencies getting involved. Uh, it was almost like a little bit of a club. People knew each other. And, and certainly uh, in 2017, we saw an interesting shift in our counterparty base where, particularly in the United States, uh, we have a lot more professionals now, institutions, I would say, coming in, looking at the space, trying to really understand what's going on, starting to, to dabble a little bit. That's a very encouraging sign for us. Uh, we see that as you know, these participants are coming in, they're trained professionals, um, they have quite a bit of asset base behind them, they're looking at the market now, they're, they're, they're treating it seriously, um, and they're trying to figure out whether or not they want to maybe get involved in a significant manner or, or whether or not this is just another fad. Um, in Asia, we've definitely seen an uh, a large increase. Obviously, that's why we're out here. I'm based in Singapore right now. Ashwin, my colleague, as well. Uh, we opened our desk here in November um, you know, to provide liquidity to this part of the world. And what we've seen, again, is, is a very large uptick in the amount of participants in this, in this kind of the market. Again, at the, in the still a little bit more early stage than what you see in the US, where a lot of the, the players out here are still um, sort of the retail base, sort of the uh, enthusiasts. Um, and, and some of the larger institutions are looking at it, but they're not they're not dabbling yet, which is something that we see in, in the U.S. Uh, the family office, as well, is, is another large type of counterparty base that we see coming in to be quite active in the United States. Um, and again, I think, as do more directly to your question, Dennis, about how we see that evolving over time, I think it's only natural. As the asset class becomes more developed, it becomes uh, more institutionalized, you will see professional 
money managers coming into the space. You will see them offering liquidity to their, their client bases. Uh, this is stuff, something that we're very excited about. Um, that's why we're trying to position ourselves as sort of the, the, the frontier uh, market maker in this space. Um, and you'll probably see more guys like us as well. I mean, there's been some, some headline news about other large um, institutional players coming into the OTC space. Uh, we're, you know, we're really excited about that. There's definitely a lot of um, business to be conducted. And you know, for us, we just want to make sure that we're always there providing liquidity. And that will help, and going back to the initial question about volatility, that will help bring down the volatility over time because people can come to guys like us and they can trade very large size cryptocurrencies without having a large market impact. Whereas, whereas I think right now, if you were to move significant amounts of cryptos on an exchange, for example, you would have a very large market impact because the liquidity there is not so, so, so de deep. Um, as a principal trader, we'll just show you a price and we take it directly on our book. So we absorb all that risk, all that market risk goes on our book and our professional trading team will sit there and find a way to work out of that position with very little market impact. So n I think, you know, just going back to what I was saying and summarizing um, all those points is that as the market starts to develop and you have more professional investors, more fund managers, et cetera, coming to this place and coming to the space and better liquidity providers providing two-way liquidity with principal risk that would not only dampen volatility, but it would just it would create a more stable environment and that's how the, every asset class just develops naturally. I fully agree again. Um, the volatility is going down actually. It went down back from 2013 to now already. And uh, what, the, what I have is, is we have a platform and then we can see what's, what's going on. Primarily the retailers are, are on our platform. Um, when prices are going up, everyone is buying like crazy. And when the market turns down, like they start selling. And um, <laughs> yeah. Buy at the high, sell at the low, yes? Yeah, they go the opposite of what uh, an advice would be. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the retail part, but uh, as, as more and more institutions get in, uh, that will change. It's funny because this, uh, everybody knows that buy the deep, sell the high. And, and today, funny enough, I, I got a picture in one uh, WhatsApp group saying exactly that, because they are asking me, oh, Fred, uh, Bitcoin is dropping, you're losing money. I'm not losing money. I buy the deep and I saw the high, just like the picture. The problem is it's easier said than done. Uh, most people just panic and they do the opposite. And no matter how many times they see that picture or that sentence, they do it again. <laughs> and they do it again and again and again. And uh, uh, <clears throat> that's why it's, it's important, uh, platforms like Economy, because uh, you take the, the risk out of the retail. They, you can go there and have like William investing for you. Um, but <clears throat> um, also, one thing that is important to notice is that uh, it's not that easy for Wall Street to come into crypto because okay, for us that are 24 seven, oh, this is huge, we're talking about millions, but uh, the crypto market, it's, uh, uh, it's, more than, it's more than silver. So that there is not liquidity enough, and the cake's not big enough yet for big players to add into, especially if, if you consider everything else. And also, uh, corporations has a lot of um, inertia, I would say, maybe. You, know, uh, uh, you cannot believe that uh, Goldman Sachs will have all the trouble with cold storage and do this and do that. No, so uh, maybe later this year, when trading platforms start to integrate into a crypto, into their platforms, and a trader can, okay, now gold, stocks, and crypto, they are all in the same, uh, the same screen or in the same trading platform. Now you can, then you can see uh, 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 in Wall Street kind of uh, investment coming into crypto. Um, so far, I, I believe we, we have the professionals, and it's clear, but we don't have yet large institutional investors coming in, into the market. So do, you, do you agree with this? Because that's a very interesting topic. Yeah? Because do, do you see the inflow of institutional money uh, to the market? Well, really, really seriously? Yeah, I think Fred made a, a really uh, valid point there, um, that the risks associated with being involved in cryptocurrencies at the moment uh, might be a bit of an impediment for some of the larger organizations. Um, you know, at, at, at Cumberland or DRW, we have about 850 people in our organization around the world. 
um, a lot of our systems are, are proprietary, and that's exactly what these large institutions are going to have to develop. Um, we just happen to be an early mover in the space, and, and it, it, then the importance there, the highlight there is just you know the focus on the risk management of, of how we look at everything. And on Fred's point, um, you know these larger institutions that want to get involved, they're going to have to sort of mobilize many, many different divisions in, in their organization to come together to create a, a solution so that they can have, for example, a custody solution, right? And, and Fred makes a valid point, like, you know, having a USB key controlled by some employee is not exactly the most efficient way of doing it. Yeah, it, exactly, it won't happen. So, but over time, there will be more um, products most likely being developed that will solve these issues. Um, but for us right now, I mean, all I can do is speak to how, how we do it. And, and, you know, one of the main reasons we can operate in this space in, in institutional size is because of the risk management solutions we put into place. And our in, internal IT network, the proprietary systems and software, they're all built by our programmers in-house, uh, protects our ecosystem. Um, our risk management team really focusing on all of our exposure out there. Um, this is stuff that, again, it, it, maybe we can do that because we are a smaller organization, although we're not that small. Um, you know, it's less, less bureaucratic, for example, and also the reputational risk. I mean, if you are a, a large bank, you know, you have, you have significant reputation risk. You want to make sure you really understand it carefully. Um, <clears throat> we have the same reputational risk, but uh, the orders can come down quite quickly and, and discussion can happen within the firm. And if we decide this is an area we want to move into, we can move quite quickly. So I think I totally agree with Fred on that, on that notion that um, security and the risk element of being involved on institutional level in cryptocurrencies is an, a short-term impediment to a lot of the uh, large institutional players. Going to your question, Dennis, and what we see in terms of the inflows, as I mentioned earlier, especially in the U.S. right now, we see significant pickup in institutional players starting to onboard with us, look at trading cryptocurrencies in a professional manner. That's, again, very exciting for us. They're not coming in in giant ways, I wouldn't say. Um, I don't even know if they're offering product uh, liquidity to their client base, but I think certainly what they're doing is, is they're educating themselves, trying to be ahead of the curve, because the risk to them there is that this product becomes mainstream and then they, they are not ready to offer it, they're behind the curve, right? Guys like yourselves are, are way ahead of the curve. Um, the institutional players, the first guy who gets involved will have the most inflow. So it's, it's a bit of a race for them. They're really trying to understand it early on right now to figure out whether or not if it be becomes mainstream, then they got to be able to offer it right away. So that, that's kind of what we see. We're really excited about that. Um, and, and we anticipate the same sort of move in Asia, but a, a little bit of lagging effect to the United States because over there, the, uh, the institutional investor base is a little bit further up the curve, a little bit uh, more sophisticated in understanding different products. Which, which investors are the most uh, like interested? Family funds, uh, venture, venture capital, um, uh, investment banks maybe? Um, I would say, I mean, Ash probably knows better because he's our head trader and he's, he speaks to them every day, but I'd probably say, you know, the family offices. I don't know if you agree. The family offices are pretty active. They can mobilize quite quickly. Again, the less bureaucracy, um, less hierarchical structure. If the guy who owns the family office says he wants to buy some Bitcoin, put it on a key and put it in his safe, it can be done right away, right? So um, we, we definitely saw a lot of that activity going on at the end of last year. And uh, you can actually see uh, how institutional money and big money uh, are playing, especially in Bitcoin. If, even if you look at charts, you can see institutional fingerprints, or especially the last couple of months from, from December. You, you can see where they defend a position and how they manipulate the market. And, and let's be honest, uh, crypto is a very, <laughs> very easy to be manipulated, even Bitcoin. And these kind of fingerprints are, are, are becoming clear and clear. Uh, the future market has also had a, 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 an impact um, from the futures, uh, CMO and, and so on. And we, we could see that the, the, the move from 6,000 to 20,000, it was not only driven by retail, but probably a, a lot of these uh, smart money uh, already starting to play. And of course, uh, new players, they won't pay $10,000 for uh, get into the market. So now again, I, I have no doubt that these, they, they, <laughs> they put their, their finger over there and they had a lot to do with the pricing coming down. And also, uh, it's, it's a different market. So we can expect 2018 to be uh, very different than uh, the same period in 2007, uh, 2017, I think. <clears throat> do, do, 
you agree with this uh, um, um, with this idea that uh, uh, the current market downfall uh, is partially influenced by uh, maybe partially influenced by these institutional uh, investors who want to uh, enter at a low point because uh, it's very like popular um, um, uh, popular in conversations this idea yeah. what what do you think I, I would add that not only it's uh, how they move, but also how they put news. You know, uh, um, uh, CNBC or any other media outlet, uh, the, the news have an impact in, in how the coins uh, appreciate or, or not. No, I think like that's the easiest explanation one can find to say it's manipulated without finding the... Too, too, too obvious, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I'd say too obvious, yeah. If you go back into the history and uh, things we did not understood, we always explained the easiest, simplest way that we could. And now we understand them, we explain them a bit differently. So I wouldn't say that, but uh, I would just uh, throw some uh, numbers out that are kind of interesting. So, uh, you know, the, the new accounts that exchanges were opening, uh, if exchanges were opening like three accounts per day in September, October, they were opening like 10 accounts per day, so three times more just a month later in November. And like in, the, in early December, they were opening like 100 accounts. So like 30 times X, so that's like over 3,000% more. And uh, that, that, that's, what, that's what pushed everything up. And like now, now there's a bottleneck of, uh, of the fresh inflow. And as the fresh inflow is uh, drying up, um, you eventually reach the peak. And, um, I'd like to go back uh, a little bit more to the um, discussion we had about the institutional investors. Yeah, definitely, like, um, how, how they're going to move. Uh, the family offices, offices are the smallest and the fastest one they can move in. But uh, what I was surprised, uh, recently at the past two conferences, uh, I met, so the last guys, the last guys from institutional space that will move in will be the, um, the pension funds. And I met, uh, I already started meeting, uh, meeting the the, the pension funds at the events. They're just curiously observing the space, but that's, uh, that's a nice thing to see as well. Cool. So I guess time, time for questions. Yeah. Uh, my name is Luben, I'm a VC, uh, and uh, I want to build on what uh, you just said. Uh, my question is to, to you guys, uh, and especially to Jason. Uh, there are plenty of uh, things that uh, need to be done in order the institutional money to get in. How important is building the infrastructure like the VIX, the other tools like spiders or whatever, building just the, the tools and the instruments that the professional investors are aware with in order to get into the crypto? I'm sorry, what, what do you mean exactly by the tools again? Can, I, can you I mean, you? Uh, Getting the data, getting uh, the data about uh, the inflows, getting the data about the volatility, and all the kind of things that you need in order th that the professional investors are already aware with if they go to Nasdaq or... I understand. Um, you make a very good point. Um, I can't disagree with what you said. I mean, for, for the professional investor to come in, they need data sets. They need to be able to analyze their data. Um, they need to really understand what's going on in the market. Uh, a lot of they need strong connectivity, faster connections to, to some of the liquidity sources. Uh, these are things, again, in early market, um, if you just look back at the stock market back in the day, my, my father was a stockbroker and it used to take five minutes to fill a trade because people would fax in their orders. Um, you know, in FX, you can just point and click, it's, it's really fast, and crypto is somewhere in between right now. Um, I think you make a very good point. The, the ecosystem, the infrastructure needs to develop. Um, so that the professional or the institutional investor base can feel more comfortable with really analyzing and understanding the underlying data and what's going on in, 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 the, in the market at the moment. So um, I can't say for sure which one I think is the most important or what the natural progression would be, but I, some of the stuff that you mentioned, being able to have reliable data, uh, being able to have um, you know, good liquidity, very, very important. Um, that's where we come in. And then being able to have good connectivity. So if they're trading on exchanges, et cetera, um, now you have the futures, as, as Fred mentioned, you know, that's a fast exchange connectivity. Um, these, are, these are just natural evolutions in any asset class life cycle. And as it develops and it becomes more progressive, um, it would be more, much more encouraging for the institution to get involved. But you're absolutely right. You need to see these milestones happen, I think, before 
these guys come in in, in full force. Hey, my name's Mark. I'm from CryptoProfit.com. And I agree with what Fred said that he said he doesn't lose money in cryptocurrencies. I've never lost a penny in cryptocurrency trading because I simply don't sell it for less than I buy it for, um, which up to now hasn't been that difficult. But I have the ability to do that because I don't leverage my investment. I don't buy on margin. And I wonder what your thoughts are about, about that. Somebody who's just an average Joe who's trading, would you suggest that he might leverage somehow the investment that he might buy on some kind of margin or, or how that might be looked at? I would not advise anyone to play margin trading uh, from the beginning. It's a very dangerous game. You, you can lose a lot of money very fast. But uh, on, once, you do, once you know what you're doing, you can also make a lot of money really fast. You know? uh, if you, for example, um, last week uh, when the disaster began, uh, Bitcoin lost like, uh, I, I'm not sure, uh, 500, $1,000 in four and a half hours. And the information was all there. Uh, you could read the charts and see this is an easy trade to take. And if you if you are awake, <laughs> depending on which part of the planet you are, uh, you and you let's say did like a 20 times leverage, you made like a hundred, a hundred and fifty percent in four and a half hours. So, uh, but that's a dangerous game. So I, I would not recommend anyone that is coming into the, the space to, to play margin? Uh, with the family offices coming online, I'm just curious, does it, do they typically just acquire a position and sit down and hodl it, or are they actively moving in and out and, and trading that? Um, it really varies. I mean, some of the family offices, like you mentioned, they might just want uh, exposure as a, as a percentage of their overall asset base. Um, those are the kind of guys that would buy it and stick, stick it in the safe and we wouldn't see them for a while. Um, but you also get some, some family offices where the managers are quite active. And they like looking at markets. They're very excited about volatility. Um, they might even be trading other asset classes uh, that they're exposed to. Um, and they'll come in and, and they'll be kind of two-sided. And so we do get that kind of activity as well. And that's obviously very exciting for us and they like to engage as well and speak to our traders and, and get you know a little bit better feel for the market and maybe what we're seeing and you know, some of the stuff that I share with you. So those are guys that are kind of more active managers even though it's their own kind of family money. Hi, uh, my name is Dixon. So actually I want to ask is that uh, because recently I read news that uh, CFTC actually subpoenaed uh, Bitfinex and Tether. So uh, is this actually a, is this like price correction actually a natural price correction in the early stage, or is this going to be something that's more than that? Are you asking if the correction is normal, or is, is that? Yeah. Is the price correction related to because it is just on in its early stage, or is it because, like, um, because there's this uh, case where CFTC subpoena uh, Bitfinex and Tether, where they are, they are, there's rumors saying that uh, Tether is like artificially raising the price of Bitcoin. Uh, um, despite I, I have said that there is some kind of manipulation, and I, I, manipulation maybe is not the, the right uh, word to use, but there is pressure. Um, but I don't believe that it has anything to do with between X or anything like that. It's a normal correction, and it has to do. It, it's never, never a single explanation for anything. And if you go and I don't know, but probably everybody is is part of some Telegram groups, at least for the fun. Uh, no, you, you don't need to watch television or anything else. Just read to read Telegram groups, and there's a lot of fun because people comes with these kind of uh, conspiracy theories and stuff like that, and this kind of stuff. Um, so there's not a single explanation, but it's a, a, a lot of things that come together. First, it's normal. Um, no asset can go up uh, forever. And second, as Yanni said, uh, two, two months ago, this, this was an uh, all-time high price for Bitcoin. Uh, 
um, third uh, for altcoins is this exactly the same cycle we had last year. So we should be buying now. You know, 90% of the coins are at uh, 78 uh, Fibonacci. That it's hard to lose money buying at that reload zone. And so all these kind of factors are normal. I believe uh, maybe uh, in December, uh, in the hype, people are saying that Bitcoin would hit uh, 50,000, 100,000 by the end of 2018. Personally, I don't believe. And maybe we can have, uh, like Annie said, something like 2013. Maybe we go up again, but not necessarily you're going to be at to, uh, a new all-time height in 2018. But it doesn't matter. If you're a trader, you, you, you need to play the game uh, uh, accordingly. When the price is going up, when the price is going down, there is, always mon there is always money to be made, and there is always a boo in the market, too. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, I, I run a fund in the US, and, and obviously, I, I heard some of y'all talking about bringing in family offices uh, and them being very receptive uh, internationally, where it's much more difficult in the US at this point uh, to bring those individuals along. And I was interested to find out how you position yourselves um, against the traditional market. So as you saw, the extreme volatility in the New York Stock Exchange with a drop of over 1,100 points yesterday. How do you position yourselves where you're a complement um, to those specific offices versus a competition? Um, well, I think, you know, how we operate as, um, as a principal trading firm is, is uh, just using our balance sheet to provide the liquidity to those who are looking to participate in this market. Um, for the family offices, as you mentioned, who are, who are trading multiple asset classes, uh, it's not necessarily the case that we would go to them and say, hey, you have to be involved in cryptos. In fact, we don't do any hard selling at all. Most of the time, they, they will come to us and naturally uh, do research and find out who we are and, and the fact that we could provide them with, with deep liquidity. Um, and, and they've already made the decision, for example. What I'm trying to say is they've already made the decision that they want to allocate some capital of theirs to uh, the cryptocurrency asset class. So in, in that sense, I mean, we, it's actually quite straightforward. We, we hardly even discuss with them whether or not they should be involved. It's just simply we provide them liquidity. They just come to us, very similar to, say, a retail investor um, deciding that they want to buy, you know, one Bitcoin here, and they, they open an account on an exchange, and they buy one Bitcoin. It's, it's, you know, they've made that decision already, and the exchange is actually enabling them to do so. Um, for the family offices and the institutional investors, or even the high net worth individuals who want to play an institutional size, our minimum is 100000 for example. Um, by the time they've come to us, they've already decided that they want that allocation. And all we do is make them the price, um, provide them the liquidity, so that they can get the delivery of their physical underlying cryptocurrencies um, uh, sooner than, than perhaps on an exchange. And they can do whatever they want with that. They can take it and they can put it on cold storage. They can put it on an exchange. Um, you know, for us, delivery is T0, T1. They get it pretty quickly. Um, or if they're selling, then they get the fiat the other side pretty quickly as well. So we're just an enabler, I would say, and a liquidity provider, and not necessarily a, a competitor in that sense, um, or, 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 uh, or we're not even trying to sell them the product, for example. <clears throat> One question from my side would be, um, how would you see the long-term future of uh, the Bitcoin um, and also uh, separately uh, the altcoins? Because currently, uh, from my point of view, with a uh, multiple hours transaction time and uh, huge fees, uh, the Bitcoin doesn't really have a real business case anymore. It's not a company, so most of the reasons right, for buying Bitcoin or for buying maybe also some altcoins is speculation. But actually, the good thing would be if we have, of course, the traders with liquidity, but also the long-term investors who would try to build a business case out of that. So I would like to understand how would your viewpoint be on the altcoins and on the Bitcoin? And we have the next session uh, dedicated um, to altcoins. Will altcoin dominate like um, in, in five minutes? We, we see the... D despite of this, the problems, um, Bitcoin is, is really strong, and I don't believe that uh, uh, it's going to disappear or something like that. Uh, oh, it's completely the opposite. No, we are, 
things are, are becoming more settled. And the same goes for altcoins. The altcoin game is it, it's more like an a, a internet game in the 90s. So uh, I don't believe there is a bubble in altcoin for the next six months, for example. But I'm absolutely sure that sometime in the future, we will have a pop that half of them, or even more, will disappear. Because uh, let's be honest, a lot of the projects has no reason to exist, or they have poor execution, or no, a lot, lots of reasons to disappear. And when this time comes, uh, we we'll, I, I have a hashtag that I like, that's Bubble Survivor. Then when you meet a project that has a good team, is in a good vertical, and has a product, has some traction, I call it this is a Bubble Survivor, because no matter what happens in the market, nobody, everybody's panicking and the Bitcoin goes to $2,000, they will survive because they are bringing something to the table. They are solving a problem. They are, and there's a lot of problems that blockchain really solves. So, um, but uh, this is not for the next six months, I think. We, we still have a very good summer ahead, I, I believe. <coughs> Hi. Um, so there's a common um, tip to put less than 5% or 10% of your wealth into crypto. But for people who've done it last year, it's now become maybe 80% of their wealth. And likewise, a lot of the institutional investors or high net worths are considering putting a lot of money into crypto. Are there any, given that this is about trading strategies, are there any risk governance, risk governance policies and strategies you can recommend and share on how to manage the risk of managing such a large portfolio? I will go for the simple answer. Risk management is something that you have to do for in your life for everything. You know, it, it doesn't matter if you are doing stocks, crypto, or gold. You, it, the first thing that you have to learn as a trader and as an investor is to manage risk. And if you don't know to do that, uh, pay someone to do it for you. <clears throat> so, yeah. so I just want to ask, like, what kind of ways to manage risk you can recommend? So, sorry. What, what kind of ways to uh, manage risk you would recommend? Is it in terms of capital protection? Is it oh. sort of certain rules where you don't trade under certain conditions right. and so on? How, how much? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that, everybody should follow some basic rules. Um, the first is do not put all your savings into crypto or, or even in gold. I don't know, even gold can, you know, I don't know, someone found a formula to turn gold into water and then gold price goes to zero. You, you never put your, all your money in one basket. and Yeni made a very good point that's always taking profit. And that's a very common mistake people do. They, they, they let the, the investment run until they are not making money anymore. And th th this is uh, traditional risk management and traditional strategies. You know? uh, we see, and uh, when you talk to, especially retail, uh, when you go to family office, uh, everything is different, but uh, retail, uh, people, older people tend to be more conservative. If you, in Brazil, for example, uh, we had this kind of 100 new accounts against one three months earlier. And because of that, we now have more accounts in crypto exchanges than in the stock market. It's insane. And because younger people, they are more risk taker, they, they like crypto. And they will probably put half of their money and try to make some money to buy an extra beer, maybe. <laughs> but if you're going into retirement, you don't need this kind of uh, risk. Might not be uh, like a strategy advice, but more like uh, words of wisdom. Um, 2017 was a year where you couldn't lose money. Uh, you were able to throw it into scam projects, and it, you were probably OK. Uh, so that's not gonna last forever. So pay attention to and like pay to fundamentals because like there will be projects that will just at one point of time they will turn down. Bitconnect is one of them, a recent example. And there will be many, many, many more. And there's so many similarities with the dot com bubble in the late 90s that are right now. And if you and if you would look at the space of the dot com bubble 
I think it was 95% of the companies, they crashed to zero. So here's gonna be pretty much the same. So um, what I would say, don't think you're the smartest uh, just because you were doing well in 2017 because everyone was doing well. Okay, uh, we uh, run out of time, but you have uh, opportunity to ask questions to on the next session, which is uh, starting right now. Will altcoins dominate? So let's thank the speakers.